so Mark here from Rock and Load this evening. I am joined by the one, the only Mr. Jason Netherton from Baltimore Death Metal Merchants Misery Index. The guys have just dropped their latest album, Complete Control, courtesy of Century Media Records. And Jason has kindly joined us this evening after a long drive on tour. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing okay. Just, uh, you know, tired. You know, in the U.S., the cities are pretty spread out, so... Um, you know, the drives tend to be a little bit longer, especially when you get out west. <clears throat> but uh, you know, we're used to it, so <laughs> yeah, it's it still it still takes its toll, though, doesn't it? You know, regardless of uh, how energetic and how enthused you are at the start of a tour, it's, it's it, like it takes its toll. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're and, you know we're we're seasoned. Yeah, like seasoned, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have hot sauce or whatever. So we're rolling with it. Are you back home at the moment? Yeah, yeah, we had a little little break and it kind of was in our area. So we had a little day off today. So it was working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not too bad. Not too bad. So, um, Jason, give us a little bit of history of the band. Um, I believe you guys sort of formed back in 2001. Yes, yeah, for the band in 2001. That's when we recorded our first demo called Overthrow. Um, I recorded it with a friend of mine. It was with a friend of mine originally, Mike Harrison, who started the band with, and, and the drummer, Kevin Talley, who also came uh, along with me from Dying Fetus at the time. And uh, yeah, it's I, can't, I never thought I'd still be doing it today. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say. You, you could... seventh album, and, yeah. you know, as far as the history, you know, we, we kind of, Started the band, you know, with the idea of being at its core a death metal band, but one which kind of takes a uh, healthy influence from hardcore punk and, and grind a bit. So through the years, we kind of like, I guess, use those influences to try to push and progress our sound. And and uh, at times it comes out more death metal and maybe some certain songs here and there are a little bit more grindy, more hardcore influence. So <clears throat> I think it, it gives us a kind of unique like a status or whatever position within the broader pantheon of death metal bands these days. So it's just kind of our thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you sort of touched on it there 20 odd years now into the band. I'm sure, as you said yourself at the very start, you would never have imagined that it would have had the legs that it has. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, I, I mean, I came up really, you know, to the nineties and stuff and that was like, you know, death metal had it for a brief moment, like kind of touched on mainstream, <laughs> like in the early nineties, you know, the famous kind of Columbia record signings of like, you know, more of an angel and napalm death and stuff. And, and the morbid angel were giant record. Anyways, major label kind of tinkering with extreme metal and then kind of went back underground again. And, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, when we started it in 2001, bands like Slipknot and things were kind of pushing it into the mainstream extreme metal that is. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, people know what death metal is now, and it's a part of the culture of rock, general rock music, you know, around the world. So it's, you know, it's been amazing to, you know, that the fans are there and the resources to kind of make this kind of music and do it professionally. Yeah. Which yeah. Is... <laughs> I was going to say, and so, like, did you grow up then within sort of the more extreme metal community within the Baltimore area? Yeah, I mean, originally, I was, you know, I was a kid, I was into, you know, speed metal and heavy metal and stuff. But then, of course, I discovered death metal. And yeah, in the DC, Baltimore scene, you know, there were bands like Ex Mortis and, and uh, Deceased and um, <clears throat> I don't know, Iron Christ and In Destroy and these types of bands that were kind of like pushing the envelope there in the late 80s, early 90s. And then you know, in the scene, when we started Dying Fetus in 91, you know, it was kind of like the, you know, the death metal thing was happening there too. Um, but it's still, it was still the loosely connected kind of underground community. I don't think anyone took your city, maybe Tampa in the late 80s or something had like multiple bands that constitute a larger scene, like in one concentrated place. But in DC and Baltimore, it was pretty healthy. Yeah. But, and was there um, 
a good support network, for example, of venues that allowed you guys to get out there and put music out there? Yeah, usually they're just regular clubs, you know, who some promoter convinced them to have like the show. Um, you know, rock ven- rock clubs and rock venues and stuff that would get these extreme metal bands in there, you know, every now and then. Usually at fests, it started out as fests, like, you know, Michigan Death Fest or Buffalo Death Fest, you know, where they would throw these, just get underground bands from all over a particular region to come and play. And, and it was always probably fun for the sound guy. <laughs> Usually the sound guys are these old school, like rock guys, you know, they grew, you know, from the seventies or something. And, you know, they're trying to mix, they don't even know how to mix or mix a blast beat or like all these other things that are going on. So it was like, it took a while for, for, I think the sound engineering uh, <laughs> school or whatever to kind of catch up with how to mix and, and even yeah. record. I can imagine, I can imagine the challenges. <laughs> yeah. um, what about yourself uh, then, Jason, as, a, as an, a musician? Did you always gravitate towards the bass or did you start anywhere else? Um, I don't know, like in my, in my little scene or whatever, like uh, everybody was playing guitar and it was all about guitars and, and drums. So bass was like the one thing that everybody was like, <laughs> I don't know, it seemed like it was cool because it wasn't the thing everybody wanted to do. And I was kind of sold on it because Steve Harris, you know, from Maiden kind of made it like a prominent thing. Like he was always up front, major songwriter, the bass was audible and always like doing something cool in Maiden. So that kind of made it cool too for me. So that with that in mind, I jumped into it and started learning Maiden songs. And <laughs> Never looked back from there. And yeah. what about what about the vocal side of things? Have you always... Um been involved in vocals or is it something you sort of pushed yourself to when you set up a new band yeah like in in 91 when, when we started dying fetus that was like the you know we just we just started for fun it wasn't anything we we're taking it too seriously we we're just like a little three-piece thing so we just started experimenting with vocals and just seeing what we could do as far as death metal vocals and i just you know i like some key guys like carl from bolt thrower luke from gore guts Chuck from death and you know, all those kind of things. And so I just, you know, without knowing how to do it, just started trying to growl and, you know, push the, the boundaries of the, you know, <laughs> the human body in a sense and see what my throat could do to make, you know, these kind of sounds. So that's how it started. And I guess it was a process of refining ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you find that now, for example, when you have such multiple tour dates? Do you, you, you manage to maintain the voice okay, or is there any struggles over a long stretch of dates? Yeah, I mean, at this point, like, I've been doing it so long that, like, I know, like, the, how, what not to do and not what to do to kind of take care of it. Usually, if I haven't done it for a while, it's a process of slowly building back up to that kind of level. So like, for example, when I first sing, after not singing for a while, I can only do like maybe one song. And then I wait and then just do like two, three songs, just kind of work up to it. Yeah. And then it's like once you're on tour and you're doing it every night, it's almost like talking. It's like so it's like second nature just to like yeah, yeah, sing, yeah. I guess. And um, obviously the, the latest album just recently dropped there is a, a seriously powerful um, collection of songs. Um, how do you guys sort of see your evolution of sound over the years? Obviously, you, you were constantly trying to push the boundaries with every new album you guys bring out. So how do you how do you feel the new album sits in comparison to the back catalogue? I guess it's it's probably the most perfect representation of like... I don't know what we've been trying to do the last 10 years, I guess. The two albums before it, Rituals of Power, it's kind of a mix of Rituals of Power and the one before it, The Killing Gods. In a sense, it balances the death metal uh, most evenly, I think, with, with the uh, hardcore and grind influences. And we have also have the kind of melody in there we've been kind of messing with a little bit in the last few records um, in hints of it in spots where I think it provides some like nuance to the to the songs that makes them more interesting. And it just, we have a certain vision and we, you know, this lineup's been stable for 12 years now. So I think it's it's just the, the most solid sort of representation of our collective vision. We're, we, all, we all write the music, you know, in the sense that 
Like I wrote three songs, Mark wrote four, Darren wrote two, and Adam, our drummer, also has a key arranging writing credit for all this. So it's very much a band representation. It's not the burden of songwriting isn't on one person. So all those kind of varied influences are kind of on there. And I think, you know, when you have that much, um, when you have that many like cooks or whatever in the kitchen, it could be, it might be a hodgepodge kind of thing. But I think like we're, we, <clears throat> we've kind of balanced it like um, is the best we possibly can. And I think it's the most kind of sharper, sharpest representation of like our style. Yeah. And I got it. <laughs> and how, what, how does the songwriting process work then? How do you guys like to work together? Is it a, do you set time aside to write songs or is it more of a sort of continuous process? Well, um, <clears throat> well, I, the last few albums have been written separately, you know, basically we, we just kind of, uh, we write on our own. Like I write, we individually write like and get together like what is a pretty skeleton form of a song. And then we kind of hand it over to the rest of the band and they kind of give feedback and Adam, the drummer takes it and kind of like gives it, tightens it up with some drum ideas. And then we kind of uh, have a little bit of a back and forth dialogue about it and refinement. So <clears throat> that's the way it usually works for all of them. Uh, we don't live around each other. We live kind of separately, which in this day and age is you can still do with the technology and everything. So we don't have to all meet up in the same jam room like every week like we mm -hmm. used to. And we know our capabilities and what each of us brings. So it works. And, uh, you know, we wrote the album separately, but then we kind of meet up after like six months and we go everything in the room together. So it is isn't all totally individual, but that's yeah, just yeah. how it goes. Yeah. And this album, I believe, was was um, mixed and stuff during the pandemic. So 2021, was it? September, October 21. So yeah. was, was the songs written in advance of the pandemic or were they written during the pandemic? Um, let's see. The, well, yeah, the pandemic for us, we were on tour, actually. We were out with Napalm Death um, in Europe in February, March of 2020. And the pandemic started like literally shut, Europe shut down the day after the last day of tour. I think it was March 7th. And using that as a kind of timeline, I'm pretty sure that we had like riffs, you know, and some kind of ideas going around then. But certainly after that happened for all the rest of 2020 and 2021, um, early 2021, we you know, we were just writing on our own at that point. So I think most of all these, most everything came together in the preceding year and a half from recording. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, do you think the the space then and time and breath that you had because of the pandemic and not being on the road, did that give you maybe more time to focus on the nuances in the album itself? Definitely. <laughs> I mean, this is the fastest we've gotten an album out in the last like 12 years or something usually it's taken us four or five years between records but we got this one out in three after the last one which is pretty good so yeah pandemic downtime focus definitely uh allowed us to get the album out a year earlier than it probably would have at least yeah yeah and I've, I've always wondered i want to ask you a question and it's not a loaded question in any shape or form but um for example you guys been together 20 years you have seven studio albums now i've always wondered from like for example if the band stopped tomorrow and you look back on the catalog would you say that you've done enough or would it be a case of saying we should have maybe squeezed a couple more albums out there or is it just really down to the fact not not me not really fully understanding what it's like working within the industry how hard it is to get an album out to production with the sort of workload you have on i mean if it ended today i would be happy i never thought i never every album we put out it's always like wow i can't believe we're still doing this oh wow i can't believe we're still you know like but yeah i mean we still have a you know a modest but global dedicated following and and as long as they want to keep hearing our music and, you know, as long as the resources are still there and a label so interest, interested in helping support us, then we can carry on. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much longer we're going to be. We do, we do tour and we're kind of like more or less part time. We still do a few tours a year. I don't know if, if we're going to be doing months on end anymore. Um, 
people know who we are. I think a lot of people have, are, maybe have already decided whether they like us or not. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, new kids are getting into metal every day. So um, it's cool to, we want to like, if we're still making something meaningful, even for the, for the, for the kids, that's, that's even more awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and your, your, your actual lockdown experience and how was that for you? How did you find that time off the road? It was pretty nice. Honestly, it was like kind of a, I don't know, a little, a little bit of pressure off from things and like, you know, it was like kind of a, you know, a mandated uh, <laughs> countrywide kind of like calming period. You know, it's, I don't know. I, I live in, I uh, actually live in Finland, in Helsinki. Oh, right. Okay. I didn't realize. Okay. Um, so I've been, I was there, you know, for, I'm not there. I'm in the U.S. now, but over there, and it was like, you know, like a lot of European countries when the lockdown, it was like, you know, the, I remember the summers were nice. Just, you know, we did a lot of things outside, you know, a lot of biking and stuff. And it was you know, with everything kind of closed, it forces you to kind of do other things and put energy in other things. So maybe even more meaningful things. So yeah. yeah lockdown do, was, uh, do you think then coming out to the other side of the pandemic that you have had a different sort of um, outlook on what you're doing and on your you know, approach to say the music industry moving forward? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I mean, moving forward, like tours and everything are going to kind of, you know, there's still kind of like, uh, you don't know what's going to happen or when. I mean, it seems like the pandemic's over now and everything's so-called normalized, um, but it's still uncertain, especially the extent that you have to put a lot of money up front. For example, before a tour, a lot goes into like down payments for vehicles and flights and everything. There's a lot of investment there. Yeah. which doesn't get realized unless you actually do all the dates on the tour, merchandise, everything. So <clears throat> there is uh, some danger in that. But if, you know, if things, you know, there's also the issue with, with Ukraine and, and the uh, gas prices and things like that, which are getting to the point, you know, for which are causing ticket prices to rise and merchandise prices to rise. And, and there's only so far, you know, the metal dollar or the metal euro or what have you, or, or pounds can be spent on, you know, under certain conditions. So it really depends on, you know, there's a lot outside of just the culture industry, like it, it kind of shapes how, what is and is it possible. So, yeah. well, hopefully, you know, things get better and, and stabilize. That's all we can, we can do is like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The art, you know, art survives in some way throughout all this. So, yeah, ch challenging times indeed. It's it's been a crazy few years, and nobody really knows what's around the corner, even moving forward. So, yeah. um, and regarding like yourselves and your genre, it's quite obviously quite niche. Um, over the years, has have you had the battle for your place with record labels, for example, to let you guys do what you do? Yeah, I mean, yeah, in our scene, uh, it's. We have been on a few labels. We're on Relapse in the U.S. and then most recently on Season of Mist, French label. And I find that the labels, I mean, if you know, they give you totally free reign creatively. I don't think there's any at this level. There's no, uh, <laughs> there's no meddling or anything or suggesting or anything from the from the labels as far as like what you do. They've you know, they appreciate what you do. And, and even though it's a kind of, a, you know, extreme kind of transgressive type of music, I think when they sign you, they, they understand that. And, and we do have free reign and we have, we've always felt compelled to, to, to express ourselves lyrically and musically how we, how we do. So yeah. Yeah. Thankfully they've all been supportive and we haven't had any issues. <laughs> And the likes of the guys who you worked with for um, recording and mastering, et cetera, uh, Will Putney and, and Jens, um, are those guys you worked with before or did you like to mix it up with uh, each album? Um, we've tended to go uh, here and there. We've, we've used different producers through the years. Um, we used uh, 
Kurt Ballou from Converge, he did traders back in 2008. And we used uh, Right Way Studios um, in Baltimore for the following two records, Heirs of Thievery and um, Ritual, uh, sorry, Killing Gods. But in 2019, that's when we, we tried something different. Um, and that's when we used Will Putney the first time. Mm. Um, he mixed and mastered that one. This time around, um, we just use Will uh, for the mixing because we really liked some of the mastering work. Did a test of at the ends. Sorry, Fascination Street um, did a, a test master for us and we really liked it. So we decided to have uh, them master it this time around. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, we're, we're, not, we're never really locked into a particular um engineer or, or producer or what have you uh we're pretty open to we'll just see where we are and what we feel like and the next time it comes around and <laughs> yeah 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 and, and as far as a time in the studio then do you guys experiment much with your sound when you're in the studio or do you you tend to have a very clear vision of what you want by the time you get there yeah it's it's pretty refined at this point um you know, a lot of the stuff we because we're separated out, we, we each record in our own locales. And even our guitarist, Darren, he he records, he has a home studio where he records everything. So does Mark. Um so Adam the drummer, he, he records at a local studio. So it's pretty much, you know, we know exactly what to provide. And this, you know, in the last two albums, we basically provided everything to Will. And Will actually mixed it using all his tools. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you guys are just currently on tour at the moment with Origin, then, isn't that right? Uh, how many dates have you got left? Um, we got three left. Three left. Yeah. And what, what's on the cards next? I know you have a number of um, European festival dates as well over the summer. Yeah, that's um, coming up in a month. We're going to be coming over for a festival in, outside of Berlin called Protzen. And then the next day, we're flying to France to do Hellfest. Yeah. And then uh, August is a big festival. I think we're doing like six or seven over three weeks there, plus some club dates. So, yeah. Do you try and mix in a couple of sort of headline dates for yourselves and to make it worthwhile during the time of doing those festivals? Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. The festival is the main reason we're there. And a lot of other bands are also doing the same thing. So the club dates between festivals are always kind of a tricky thing to pull off. Yeah, I can imagine. You're not really on a tour and there's not really tour packages. So bands are trying to get random headlining shows between during the week. So there's a lot of competition for those dates and uh, sometimes they're better than others. But, you know, we have a good booking agent and they're, he's kind of, and they're kind of teaming us up with other bands that are doing the same thing so we can kind of yeah. make it work so it, it must be a crazy time at the moment though because every single band at the moment is, is vying for space on the road you know the club dates and i see a lot of bands doing co-headline yeah. tours just it's just to really make it work. yeah crazy yeah it's mega saturated in the u.s right now and i think it's hurting all the tours in a sense yeah um yeah. and how, how do you like the um I mean, it, we were just in Montreal like a week and a half ago in, in there. Oh, sorry, sorry, go on ahead. What a glitch. Oh, yeah, we are just in Montreal a week and a half ago, and they were telling us that there's a metal show every night of the week, and often two or often, sometimes often two on the same night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, big, big packing stores. So, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And we'll see. How do you feel about the festival slots versus i say a headline slot do you, prefer, do you like those festival slots sort of playing in front of crowds that aren't your own or do you prefer the the headline slots when you have your own guys in front of your your own fans i are both cool for different reasons you know the whole festival thing is like it gives you know an opportunity to get on a big stage and play in front of thousands and it's a great feeling and oftentimes, you know, you know, a lot of the other bands there are people and it's like backstage is kind of like a family reunion thing. And, and uh, it's a, they're both equally cool <laughs> um, for different reasons, I guess. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, equally, equally as tiring, I'm sure, as well, the, the, the traveling throughout Europe, then never mind just across the States. I'm oh, sorry, you broke up there a little bit. Can you repeat it? Yeah, sorry. I was just saying it must be equally tiring, the, the traveling across Europe, um, uh, other than just through the States. Yeah, I mean, it is, but in any, any American, like, uh, you know, extreme metal musician will tell you that the conditions in continental Europe are still superior to uh, the American conditions of touring. Really? <laughs> because really? in general, Europe, Europe has a far greater appreciation for culture, which extends down to even extreme metal. So that you just feel like, even as an extreme metal musician, you feel like you're treated better. As soon as you show up to the venue, you know, it's often... You know, everything's much nicer. The green rooms, the you know, the <laughs> catering. There's like a sense of like the people actually care that you showed up to play their venue. In the US, it's it can be the other way around. It's like the venue and the promoter feel like they're doing you a favor by giving you a show. Yeah. So yeah. it's like ideological kind of like gap there between the value of culture in the US and Europe, in a sense that even though you know there are long drives in Europe um the the shows themselves and the venues tend to be slightly better taken care of i don't know and, and just just have a better feeling about it yeah yeah so i'm, I'm sure the i don't really i've never experienced it, but i'm sure the touring side of things as you say in the states because the venues must drastically change in size and capabilities and quality as you say because you have venues of all shapes and sizes right across america so you probably go through a massive range of, of of sizes of show, I'm sure, on a tour. No, I was just trying to ask there, you were saying about the venues, uh, the quality of venue in America. I'm sure you must go through quite a drastic range of, of venues then when you go on a tour, like from club sizes right through to large venues. Do you see it all really on, on a tour in the States? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the, uh, the type of package. It's like, you know, if you're going around on a larger with a larger band than us and we're supporting them it tends to go to 500 cap rooms or something yeah then you're going to get more professional kind of venues and those those tend to be more professional and and have uh better setups internally yeah. than the smaller venues um you know if it's just like a like a bar or something you know or something which has a place which random place which has a stage for like 200 people then the, you know the amenities and everything is going to be a step down and it's you know we get the you know you kind of get both depending on the tour it is so yeah um, and when you come to europe then as an example um are you still finding you're still establishing yourself over here or do you, do you have a good established fan base that comes to the shows um europe is like is always historically been better for us for whatever reason they, they they're into like our style of death metal a little bit more than, than in the U.S., especially in Central Europe and Germany and that area, we headline. We can headline and do pretty well. Yeah, and and uh, you know, especially since we now the new album's out on Century Media, which is a German label, it seems like there's going to be an even extra push there. I just found out today actually that the label told us that it, our album, which came out last week, charted on the German charts at number twenty three. Cool. It's kind of mind blowing for a death metal record. <laughs> yeah, the Germans are a bit, a bit extreme. They like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, cool. yeah, it's solid, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. Okay. Well, look, Jason, look, thanks for your time, man. I really appreciate talking to you today. And obviously, I apologize for dragging you out of your bed if you've been traveling all night. Oh, it's no problem, Mark. <laughs> you know, always, always down to chat yeah well look I, once again thanks very much for your time absolute pleasure talking to you once again Jason Netherton um, the, check out the guy's new album again and say Complete Control just out on Central Media Records uh, well worth a listen thanks very much Jason right on thanks a lot Mark take care thanks now bye